Hi, welcome to Physionic, where we learn the body from the macro to the micro. If that's something you think you'd be interested in, then consider subscribing. So today we are going to be discussing the fasting mimicking diet for the third piece of content based on this paper, which I will have linked in the description box. Now, we will be discussing specifically how fasting or fasting mimicking diet has an impact on your brain, your brain health. So if that's what you're here to find out about, then let's jump into this examined content. So before we get into the results of the paper, we're going to be discussing a little bit of the experimental method. So as with the other content related to this paper, we're going to be mainly focusing or pretty much all of the material is going to be on mouse models. So that is a four day fast or fast mimicking phase. And then they have their refeed phase for seven days. So they're measured at within the fasting phase as well as seven days after the fasting phase has ended where they can eat as much as they would like. Now in terms of the tests that they do, uh, they have a lot of behavioral tests in terms of like rotorod tests. I'll post a picture of what that looks like. And they also looked at a lot of immunohistochemistry looking for particular markers, cellular markers that occur within the brain. So with that said, Let's jump into the results. So beginning with figure 3A and B, specifically A first, they looked at a rotorod test. So they essentially put the mice on a tube and see how long the mouse can stay on top of that tube or stay clinging onto that tube because there's a fall if they fall off the tube. And they see that with the fast mimicking diet after a refeed of seven days, so that's certainly not during the fasting period, but after they've been uh, refed after seven days, you see a better performance, a better ability to cling onto that rod uh, over time. Figure 3B looks at pretty much the same thing, but what it actually also looks at is repeated bouts. So if you were to uh, have them on the rod, then take them off, let them rest for a little while, then put them back on, what do you see? You see again a better performance with the fasting plus refeed condition compared to aged matched control animals. Now, with that said, however, in the actual literature, the actual written section, they do mention that once you normalize for weight, that you do not see an effect. And that's incredibly important because if you were to just look at the graphs, you would most likely think that fasting has an impact, a positive impact on the ability to stay on that rotor rod. And because of previous material, we also know that their lean mass did not change significantly. It stayed relatively stable and their fat mass decreased. So they're leaner, but their musculature remains stable. So of course they're going to have less weight to hold up. That makes sense. And not only that, whatever weight they do have is going to be primarily active metabolic muscle tissue, which of course is going to be able to sustain itself as well as other tissue in its own right. So based off of the rotorod test, we see no significant differences between control animals and fasting animals. Now for figures 3, C, D, and E, they are all tests of recognition as well as cognitive patterns. So th these are subjective measures. Would I necessarily put a whole lot of stock into them? No, I wouldn't, uh, mainly because you probably need to fulfill that with or add on to it with better measures that aren't going to be behavioral in nature. But based off of these three 
tests, especially the recognition tests, you see that the fasting animals tend to be more curious. They tend to explore more on novel objects and they tend to recognize objects uh, at a higher capacity than control animals. Now, of course, they have more tests and those more tests come in the later figures. Now, for some of their testing, some of these behavioral tests, they had to train the animals. So they had to go through a seven day training protocol. And during that training phase, they noticed that the fasting animals made fewer errors in their training than the control animals. So that could provide some minor evidence that fasting animals are a little bit sharper or a little bit more able to take in or absorb information. And then if you look at 3G, you see that the same animals, the fasting animals, have better recollection of the task that was presented to them just two weeks prior. So that's certainly uh, indicative, but again, you're looking at subjective measures. I know that they've got measures for what constitutes meeting the criteria for success or failure, but still you're going to have researchers that have to determine that and it's not going to be as, I'll say, unbiased as one might hope through biochemical measures. Not to say that biochemical measures are perfect, but they're certainly far more objective than behavioral measures. And finally, for figures 3H and I, you see that the fasting animals tend to have a better ability to have success in their training. So to complete their training, to complete the tasks that they were trained for, as well as being able to achieve those tasks in a better fashion, in a more efficient fashion, meaning that there is some sort of cognitive change there in terms of not necessarily having it be random, but it is more calculated and thought out in terms of how they approach their success. And that, of course, reduces the amount of time that it takes to complete the task successfully. Now, moving on to figures for A, B, C, and D, you see here that we have the aforementioned immunohistochemistry. So essentially, they're taking slices of the brain and they're staining it with particular antibodies or particular detection reagents that are able to pick out particular proteins. Now, for this, they use BRDU and they use a DCX model. Now, the BRDU is going to stain for DNA and the DCX is going to be a stain for microtubule proteins that are specific to precursor cells of neurons. So this is going to be a far more specific, far more uh, quantitative way of going about trying to figure out if you see changes in the brain. Now, based off of the immunohistochemistry, you can see there, and they point this out, that you see changes in BRDU, and of course you see increases in DCX as well. So according to both measures, you see changes. Now with DCX, you don't necessarily see a significant change, and that's something you can see by the graph, but you can see that there is a stability there that is maintained. Now, based off of the BRDU, where they show that you see decreases in BRDU with age in figure 4B, it's really encouraging to see that BRDU climb back up when you go through a fasting plus refeed situation. And then if you use both of those markers and use those as kind of a double confirmation, you see that the there is a certain benefit, a certainly high benefit, to fasting over the control animals of the similar age. And finally, figure 4i is where they look at a particular neurogenerative marker called NeuroD. And NeuroD is thought to be necessary for a precursor cell, a undifferentiated, uh, essentially an unestablished cell, to then be differentiated into a neuron, meaning that then it knows exactly what path it needs to go and to turn into another cell. And that's essentially what you're talking about when you're talking about stem cells. So you see this uh, change in this expression of NeuroD that is favorable in the fasting condition. So after looking at all those graphs, I would not feel comfortable saying that fasting has a positive impact on brain health. But what I can say is that fasting may have an impact, a positive impact 
on memory. Because again, they're looking at hippocampal. They're not looking at necessarily uh, the amygdala. They're not looking at the cognitive function of the cerebrum. They're not looking at a variety of different areas of the brain. They're just looking at memory. And then of course they've got their behavioral test, which as I mentioned before, just isn't that great of a marker. I, I like their immunohistochemistry. I appreciate uh, some of their other measures, which certainly validate some of the behavioral functions, but in terms of can you go beyond memory, I don't think that you can. So based off of the data that was provided, I would say that fasting may have an impact, assuming that this translates to humans, which they, they did not have any human data in this particular collection of work, that fasting may have a positive impact on memory and neurogeneration in the memory sections of the brain, which is a powerful, powerful uh, conclusion, but that does not necessarily mean that it translates to other sections of the brain, which may have different uh, necessary components that need to be fulfilled for that to happen. Fasting may have an impact on those other areas, but it also may not because we have no data and we certainly can't go off of the behavioral aspects alone to then extrapolate from that and go and assume that that's going to have an impact on all kinds of other areas of the brain. We see neurogenesis and uh, positive movements within the memory section and nothing else. That's all we can go off of. So hopefully that was informative for you. Hopefully you got something out of it. And this is the third part, the third component of this content related to this paper. And I hope that I have the pleasure of speaking with you in the next one. Have a good one guys. See ya.